want to round up the afternoon by talking fairly briefly on the issue of Calvin and Calvinism. Um, really how the, the thought of Calvin is received and developed in the years uh, towards the end of his life and, and after his death. I want to start by making a, a fairly simple point, but one that needs to be made, and that of course is that there's a sense in which Calvinism as such doesn't exist. Generally speaking in history, when you have a term ending in ism, it's usually what we call a, a construct of historians. Um, there are numerous isms one can think of, Augustinianism, communism, Calvinism. Uh, when a term has an ism at the end of it, often it's a, it's a term used by historians to try to gather together a group of people who may not have actually, or a group of ideas that may not have self-consciously related to each other in precisely those terms. And Calvinism, I think, is one of these. Uh, I would much rather abandon the term of Calvinism and just refer to reformed theology or reformed orthodoxy. Because that, I think, points us towards the, the broader category that Calvinism belongs to, and that is of the churches that hold to the kind of theology of which Calvin was one representative. Even in his own day, Calvin was not the, uh, the single dominant intellectual force within Protestantism or within reformed Protestantism in the way that, say, Luther was within Lutheranism. Lutheranism is different in some ways because you do have a single personality, Martin Luther, who dominates Lutheranism. And in the years after Luther's death, the nature of the Lutheran church, or the Lutheran churches, is shaped by reactions to his writings, how they're interpreted, how it's appropriated. There is a great struggle that goes on in Lutheranism after Luther's death between the so-called Philippists, the followers of Philip Melanchthon, who was Luther's youngest sort of right-hand man in Wittenberg, and a group known as the Genesio Lutherans. And the Genesio Lutherans were those who claimed to be the, the pure followers of Martin Luther, the real carriers of the torch, the ones who are militantly opposed to the Reformed. Um, I often wondered, reading Luther's Table Talk, I do recommend Luther's Table Talk to you, it's a, it's a great collection of... Uh, anecdotes that he would give or, or tales that he would tell while sitting around the table drinking beer with his friends. There's some very funny uh, stories in there and of course the more beer he'd drunk the funnier the stories generally tended to be. Um, one famous occasion he's asked uh, how has the Reformation succeeded? And his comment at the table is I don't know. I just sat around drinking beer with my friend Philip Melanchthon and the word of the Lord was out there doing it all. When he hears of the death of uh, Zwingli uh, Zwingli is killed on the battlefield in Capel, the Second Capel War in 1531. News arrives in Wittenberg of Zwingli's death and, Zwingli, and Luther's comment is simply those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Uh, I've often wondered reading Luther's uh, table talk, why there's a section in there on astrology? There's a section in Luther's table talk on astrology and it's various critical comments that Luther makes about astrology. And it was a mystery to me why in the middle of this great book that's generally dealing with theological topics you have this section, Trashing Astrology. Well, the answer is it's the, the person who edited the book. It was edited by a man called Arafaba. And Arafaba was a leading Genesio Lutheran. And one of the things you need to know about Philip Melanchthon is he was a big fan of astrology. Melanchthon is invited to come to England for a great Protestant conference. Uh, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, has this idea of a Protestant assembly or conference to match the Council of Trent, the great Catholic uh, conference in Italy. And he invite, invites Melanchthon to come to England and attend this conference. And Melanchthon won't go because he's had his horoscope cast. And the horoscope tells him that if ever he travels across water, the boat will capsize and he will drown. So he refuses to travel ever by water because of what his astrologer told him tells us a lot about how views of science and what is and isn't scientific has changed over the years, but also indicates why astrology is included in Luther's table talk. It's all part of the war that's going on within Lutheranism about who the genuine successors of Luther are. And that's an example of how Lutheranism is really a struggle over the legacy of one man. There is nothing parallel in the Reformed churches because Calvin, neither Calvin nor Zwingli nor Bullinger, ever commanded the same sort of following, never had the same sort of authority as Luther had in Lutheranism. 
You see this most dramatically in Elizabethan England when you think of the rise of Puritanism and we think often of Puritanism as a Calvinist movement. But actually, the theological textbook in England, the most popular theological textbook, was the Decades of Heinrich Bullinger. Textbook written by Bullinger, not by Calvin. We tend to think of the Puritans, the early Puritans as Calvinists, but they'd be more accurately described as Bullingerians, if you like. It's more of a mouthful, of course. It doesn't sound quite as cool. But that was where they were getting much of their inspiration from. So the first point to make about Calvinism is it's a misnomer. Calvin was only ever at best primus inter pares, first among equals when it came to the Reformed faith. He was not a man whose legacy was wrestled with in the same way that the legacy of Luther was within the Reformed Church. So what I want to do to just now is to run through, really, some of the great confessional moments in Reformed theology in the 16th and 17th century, not Calvinist theology. And that's not to say that Calvin and his writings aren't hugely influential on the formation of these confessions, but it is to say that he's not the only person influential. The job of the confession writers in the 16th and 17th century is to be churchmen and to present what they see as the Catholic teaching of the Reformed churches, not simply to confessionalise what Calvin wrote. So it's an important distinction to grasp in your minds. Well, the first important confession of the 16th century occurs in 15... Well, the, the numerous ones were... The first really influential one on a national level, I think, is the Scots Confession of 1560. The date is significant. If you go and study the history of confession writing, you'll see that Protestant confession writing really takes off from 1560 onwards. Why does it do that? It does that because Catholicism in the shape of the Council of Trent, has finally begun to define itself. One of the things that we, we think about, we, Protestants often have various influential misconceptions of Catholicism. One of the ideas we have of Catholicism is that the dawn of the Reformation, Catholicism is a fairly clear and coherent body of doctrine. That's not the case. It actually isn't the case today. Catholicism is pretty diverse. Pretty diverse, really. But at the start of the 16th century, Catholicism has not made any pronouncement on a whole host of doctrines, not least of which is justification. Is Luther or is he not heretical on justification from the Catholic Church's point of view in, say, 1520, 1521? Who knows? Because the Catholic Church has not made any statement about what the normative position on justification is. It's only as these questions arise that Catholicism is forced to define itself. So, uh, there's one possible exception in Europe, I think, to, to Catholicism being a fairly broad-based and rather loosey-goosey sort of, well, I'd say woolly movement at the start of the 16th century, and that's Spain. Catholicism in Spain is pretty militant at the start of the 16th century, and the reason for that, of course, is you have significant minority populations. You have Jews and you have Muslims in Spain. If you're in Germany, the start of the 16th century, you don't need to know why you're a Catholic. There is no other option. Unless you want to be a loony of some kind. But if you're a normal sane person, you're going to be a Catholic. You don't have to think about why you're going to be a Catholic. You do have to think about that in Spain, the start of the 16th century. And I think it's why Spain provides much of the powerhouse of the Catholic Reformation. Where do the Jesuits come from? They come from Spain. Because in Spain you've got several centuries about thinking about what it means to be a Catholic in a way that you haven't had to do that anywhere else in Europe. But by and large in Europe, Catholicism is pretty ill-defined. With some exceptions, uh, the, fir, uh, the, the Fourth Lateran Council, Transubstantiation, there's some things you have to believe, but by and large it's pretty loose. That all changes from the late 1540s when Catholicism co convenes, uh, when the Pope convenes a great council at Trent, invites the Protestants, but they turn up uh, too late, um, not that they would have had much of an influence anyway. Um, I used to joke about the Council of Trent, it's a bit like the First and Second World Wars, the Protestants and the Americans, they kind of turn up very late in the day, if you like, but the Americans, unlike the Protestants, did make a significant difference, of course, particularly in the Second World War. But the Protestants arrive late at the Council of Trent, have no influence at all. What happens is Catholicism defines itself very, very clearly 
on a lot of the key doctrines in Christendom. Now, that has territorial implications. You live in Europe in the 16th century. You're, we can't talk about nations because nations really emerge in the 19th century. But the territory where you live is going to define itself not only politically but also theologically. You don't know, you live in a reformed territory or you live in Catholic territory or you live in Lutheran territory and that will immediately tell anybody from the outside where your political alliances lie. And we talked about this yesterday in the issue of Bern. Geneva has to follow Bern because they need military protection and that does have implications for how often you celebrate the Lord's Supper. So as Catholicism defines itself and as uh, territories begin to latch on to Catholic confessions, so those territories that want to be Protestant need to produce confessions as well. And one of the first and most significant of those is the Scots Confession of 1560. And the genius behind the Scots Confession is a man called John Knox. John Knox is a very interesting figure, born probably around about 1510, we're not sure exactly when he was born, comes to prominence in the early 1540s when he emerges as the bodyguard of a man called George Wishart. George Wishart is... Uh, a vigorous Zwinglian preacher in Scotland and John Knox is the man who carries the sword for George Wishart literally carries the sword it's a 19th century painting I think Banner of Truth used it for the cover of the R.L. Dabney book on, on preaching or on sacred rhetoric picture of George Wishart preaching and there's this scary looking guy standing in front of him with a two handed sword John Knox Wishart, of course, is burned. March the 1st, 1536, uh, 1546, George Wishart is burned at the stake by, uh, on the orders of a man called Cardinal Beaton. Cardinal Beaton is then murdered. He's assassinated in St. Andrew's Castle a few weeks later. And the castle is put under siege and John Knox goes to the castle and becomes the pastor of the men who have assassinated Cardinal Beaton. The French come, bombard the castle, take Knox captive and pack him off for 18 months as a galley slave. Galley is an interesting place to be in the 16th century. We have examples uh, of people who were tried by the Inquisition who would confess to more serious crimes than those of which they were accused in order to make sure they could get executed rather than sent to the galleys. Galleys was, it was a living hell on earth and then you died kind of thing. It was a long, slow execution, effectively. But Knox will be a galley slave for 18 months and survive. Shows you something about the, the physical and mental hardness of the man. And there's this amusing anecdote in the history he writes of the Reformation in Scotland where he talks about the practice of the French uh, galley master to bring down uh, what he calls a painted broad, a painted sort of board, which has an image of the Virgin on it that he makes the, the Scottish Protestants kiss. And when he hands it to Knox, Knox, as he says in his account, looks advisedly about him and then throws it overboard. And he says, there's just a laconic phrase, he says, and afterwards was no Scotsman urged with that idolatry. So even in the galleys, Knox is an outspoken and tough character. He sprung from his galley slavedom in uh, 1649 and recruited by the Protestant establishment in England, where he will be packed off from London to Durham. It's a great move, great move on behalf of the English authorities. One, you put him up north near the Scottish border to attract Scottish Protestant rebels over the border and destabilise the border. And you want the border destabilised because the further away you get from London, the more Catholic the church is. And the Bishop of Durham is going to, the Catholic Bishop of Durham is going to have his work cut out trying to stabilise the border because Knox is attracting these rebels over the border. The other advantage, of course, is that you send a man like Knox, who is a natural troublemaker, as far away from London as possible. So he can't make trouble for you. It's a sort of everybody wins kind of move. And Knox there establishes himself as not only a great debater, but also a great preacher. He will later return to London and be a court preacher for Edward VI, the young boy king. And Knox fits exactly that sort of paradigm I was talking about this morning. That for Knox, the Reformation is about the suppression of idolatry. For Knox, young Edward VI is King Josiah. When Josiah dies, when Edward VI dies and is replaced by his sister Mary, the Catholic monarch, guess what? Mary is Jezebel. And guess why Mary has come in? 
Mary has come in because the Reformation was not pushed vigorously, vigorously enough by the English authorities. So God has come in judgment against the nation as far as Knox is concerned. So Knox is a man who has been schooled, really, in the, pardon the pun, but Knox from the school of hard knocks, one might say. Hard knocks from the school of hard knocks. When uh, Mary succeeds to the throne, 1553, Knox flees to the continent, where he will spend time studying in Geneva. He will pastor a congregation of exiles for a while in Frankfurt. And then finally he will return to Scotland in 1560, where he will help put together the Scots Confession which is essentially Reformed theology put into English, put into Old Scots, if you like, which will become the normative confession of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland prior to the adoption of the Westminster Standards in the wake of the Solemn League and Covenant in the next century. So Knox is the first, one of the first great Reformed confession writers. Another great confession of the 1560s, or confessional document, 1562, the Heidelberg Catechism. Heidelberg is a singularly important place on the continent. The continent is dominated by the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire is essentially the German Empire of the Middle Ages. Germany doesn't exist as such, but the German lands are what are known as the Holy Roman Empire. And the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire is elected. It's not when the emperor dies, his son takes over. It's not the British monarchy. The emperor is elected. And there are seven electors in the Holy Roman Empire. When an emperor dies, get together and elect the new emperor. Critical to the Reformation. Martin Luther happens to live in electoral Saxony. Electoral Saxony. The ruler of Saxony, although he doesn't have big armies and doesn't have much finance or power, is an elector. He has a crucial vote in the empire. And the emperor just happens to die in 1519 which makes the elector of Saxony one of the seven most important people in Europe and gives him a certain amount of leverage with the Catholic Holy Roman Empire that buys Luther crucial time to do his reforming work. But in the 1560s, the elector Palatine, the elector who lives in Heidelberg, who is the single most important elector in the empire because when the emperor dies... The vicar of the empire is typically the elector Palatine, the elector who lives in Heidelberg, changes from Lutheranism to the Reformed faith and commissions the production of a catechism that will be acceptable to the moderate Lutherans but put forward Reformed doctrine. That is the Heidelberg Catechism. For those of you who haven't read it, I recommend it. It is one of the, I think, single most pastorally beautiful productions from the church throughout its 2,000 year history. It starts by focusing upon assurance and the grounds of assurance and it ends by talking about the certainty of our prayers. It's beautifully pastorally constructed. Wonderfully Protestant. This focus on assurance. I want to talk a little bit about this in this uh, uh, lecture. Some people say, you know, what is it you... Why should one be a Protestant rather than a Catholic? And there are many reasons why one would want to be a Protestant rather than a Catholic. There are also, in this day and age, I think there are certain reasons why Catholicism might prove to be attractive. And what I say to, when, when, when students say to me, you know, what should I say to my Catholic friends about the Protestant faith? Why should they become Protestants? I generally say, well, wading in and saying that you think the Pope is the Antichrist, that's generally not a good way to do it. Um, that doesn't win people over. It's probably not biblical. Um, the, there are better ways of doing it. I think one of the things that one should do when one's talking to Catholic friends is acknowledge the many good things in the Catholic Church. You have that sense of history and continuity. My own experience of Catholicism has been, by and large, there is a certain reverence in the worship services. There are all kinds of problems, not least transubstantiation that we've heard about. But the way I would pitch uh, my discussion with, with a Catholic would be, what do you lose If you're a Protestant and you become a Catholic, what do you lose? And the thing you lose above everything else is assurance. As a Catholic, you can only have a moral certainty that you'll be saved. And what that basically means is, if you be a good Catholic, keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best, you can have a reasonable hope 
but you'll make it to heaven in the end. Protestantism is very different. Right from the start of the Reformation, the issue was, how can I know that God is gracious to me? How can I be certain of that? And the Heidelberg Catechism beautifully puts that up front and central. Assurance is the great practical Protestant distinctive. There's a whole heap of other stuff that I think is more biblical in Protestantism than in Catholicism. Not least our understandings of justification and our understandings of the Lord's Supper. And they're all intimately connected to the pastoral issue of assurance. Remember, when you think about the Reformation, of course, that this isn't, it is not a a a revolution in the lecture theatre. It's first and foremost a revolution in pastoral practice. It's a revolution that speaks to the common people first and is worked out in its detail in the lecture theatres. But it's driven by pastoral concern. The Heidelberg Catechism captures that beautifully. It's often described as having a very ecumenical tone as well. There are certain things absent from the Heidelberg Catechism, like predestination. Because the idea was to keep the Lutherans, as many of the the sort of left-leaning Lutherans, on board as possible. And they weren't big on predestination. The uh, the Mass is described as an abominable idolatry. So when you use the term ecumenical about the Heidelberg Catechism, it's not ecumenical by modern ecumenical standards, it's ecumenical by the standards of the 1560s, if you like. And they set the bar... Uh, considerably lower, shall we say, for ecumenicity in those days than we would today. So the Heidelberg Catechism then, the second uh, beautiful uh, construction. Third confession, the Belgic Confession, 1563, written by an individual, a man called Guillaume de Bray, William de Bray, a Frenchman who would be martyred for his faith in the late 1560s. 1563, this mysterious confession starts to show up. Starts to show up in the Netherlands, the Low Countries, uh, what we would know now, Belgium and the Netherlands. It was bigger in those days. The Belgic Confession is a way, at the time of expressing opposition to Spanish control of the Netherlands. Great example of how theology and politics mesh together. It's a remarkable confession and written by one man. Typically in the history of the church, confessions have been the products of synods or committees. The Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession are interesting in that they're the products more or less of a single hand. A man called Zachary Asinus in the case of the Heidelberg Catechism, Guillaume de Bray in terms of the Belgic Confession. And we can add to that list of single hand confessions The second Helvetic Confession, 1566. The great confession that comes out of Zurich. uh, Written by Heinrich Bullinger. It's very neglected today. If you will look at Reformed churches today, most Reformed churches in America will look back to what they call the three forms of unity. Heidelberg Catechism, Belgian Confession, and the Canons of Doors, or to the Westminster Standards, the Confession, Larger and Shorter Catechism, and perhaps uh, the Directory for Public Worship. The second Helvetic Confession more or less forgotten. But it does make one or two interesting and unique contributions. Not least the fact that it describes the preaching of the Word of God as the very Word of God itself. Confession says, we believe when the Word of God is truly preached by somebody properly appointed to the task, it is, and the Latin is very strong, it is the very Word of God itself. And I was talking uh, over lunch with, to, with, with Sean about a book that's just been published that basically trashes all of the preaching of the last 30 years. And there's a certain amount of trouble, I won't tell you, some of you can guess the book and you can guess who wrote it. But there's a certain amount of truth that, that maybe preaching is not all it should be all of the time. What concerns me about a book like that is, one of the things I say to the students at the seminary is, you know, when you go to church and you hear a rubbish sermon, The first question you've got to ask yourself is not, why is the preacher rubbish? The first question you've got to ask yourself is, is the problem me? Did I not hear this properly? It may be that the preacher's rubbish. I've heard a few sermons that I think were rubbish and I think if you'd heard them, you'd think they were rubbish too. I don't think with some of these sermons the problem's all been me. But I suspect quite often, in a day when the consumer is king, that we tend to sit in judgment on the Word of God more often than we suspect. And the irony is, this book is written by somebody who had 
you know, is looking back to the past and repudiating the consumer culture. I just wonder, though, if this person is perhaps a little bit more indebted to the consumer culture than they would like to acknowledge, or perhaps they're even aware of. Second Helvetic Confession is very strong. When the word of God is truly preached, it is the very word of God. Now that's a very strong statement and I think I would want to qualify it. But it does capture something of the truth. And it brings home, I think, the idea that for the Reformed, the preaching of the word of God is not a Bible talk. It is God speaking to the congregation through the mouths of the preacher. And you must be very careful before you sit in judgment over that. You've got to be pretty certain that there's something fundamentally wrong before you sit in judgment on that. So the second Helvetic Confession then, not often thought of today, but is um, I think worth getting hold of. You can download all these things for free off the internet. It's worth getting hold of and having a read. And I'll just say at this point, before I cut to two later confessions and then close, I'll say at this point that a couple of things that are nice about confessions. One, They're generally consensus documents. For all of the hoo-ha there is about the narrowness of confessionalism, by and large, confessions don't cover that many points of doctrine. They're often fairly basic documents. And they tend to cover things that everybody would agree are of significance. The second thing that interests me about them is, well, there's a lot of talk today about diversity and difference. particularly in America, a lot of talk about diversity. One of the most striking things that that strikes me as a a non-American coming into America is, it doesn't matter where I travel in America, with the exception possibly of Arizona or somewhere where there's a dramatic mountain on the horizon, a strip mall looks like a strip mall to me. You could put me down in a strip mall anywhere in America and I would not be able to tell you necessarily where I was. I was in Red Lobster this lunchtime with Sean and I'm pretty sure that the restrooms in Red Lobster here are in exactly the same place as the Red Lobsters in Philadelphia and probably in Arizona and probably in California. Uh, For all of the talk about race and skin colour, sport and popular culture, they're more unifying than anything else these days. Youth culture is probably more transcendent as a culture across the world. I mean... People in America don't know much about soccer, but even here, Manchester United means something to most people. Small soccer club from the United Kingdom. A lot of young people all over the world have heard of Manchester United. There's quite a lot of unity in the world today for all of the talk about diversity. What's interesting about Europe in the 16th and 17th century is massive diversity. You could travel from the north of Scotland to Uh, should we say that the far east of Hungary and the border with the the Ottoman Empire and you would travel through dozens of dialect and linguistic groups you would travel through a large number of different ways of organising society you would never come across a chain restaurant if you talked about Manchester in Budapest they wouldn't know what you were talking about Europe is incredibly diverse What is interesting is the unity there is in Christian confessions in Europe in the 16th century. There is a basic consensus on what Reformed theology looks like across the European continent. There's a great project being published at the moment by Reformation Heritage Books, a series of, it's going to be three volumes, translations of Reformed confessions and catechisms of the 16th and 17th centuries. Volume 1 is already out. You can already read in volume one confessions from Bohemia, Hungary, places like this. And what's stunning is the massive amount of common ground there is among these groups. That for all of the diversity in Europe, which aces the diversity, I think, in our youth culture-driven Western society today, easily, the theology, the same theology, clearly speaks across Europe. It's expressed in different idioms. There are slightly different priorities in different places. But by and large, the same core, to use the kind of American idiom, the same core works in Hungary, works in Scotland. That tells you something. tells you something about the robustness of the theology. Moving on then, the last two 
confessional uh, events, so groups I want to mention. The Canons of Door. Calvin founds the Academy of Geneva in 1559. The rector, the man in charge of the Academy of Geneva, will be a man called Theodore Beza. Beza is an incredibly long-lived man, particularly given the time, 1519 to 1605. He was 86 when he died. That's a, we were, that's a pretty good innings today. In the 16th century, that's really quite remarkable. Most people were, you know, to get into your 50s made you an old man. And Calvin dies in his, in his mid-50s. Knox lives, you know, to around about early 60s. But to live into your 80s, that's quite an achievement. Beza was quite a character. Uh, before he was converted, um, he made a living writing sort of pornographic poetry, uh, which, of course, his Catholic opponents took great delight in sort of republishing and throwing back at him in future years. And his comment was always, you know, these people deny me my repentance. Sure, I wrote this stuff when I was young, but they, they deny me my repentance. Beza becomes a significant teacher. And one of his most famous pupils is a man called Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius the man to whom Arminianism owes its name. Beza is very strongly Augustinian, very strongly predestinarian, very clear about the total depravity of human beings and about the sovereignty of God. And his, in some ways his greatest and most famous pupil, Jacob Arminius, reacts against this. Now Arminius is a, a man from the Low Countries. He's Dutch, we'd say today. I had the privilege a few years ago of giving a lecture at Leiden University and they let me sit in Arminius's chair at Leiden University. It's kind of fun to, to, to uh, teach Reformed Orthodoxy from the chair of Arminius for an afternoon. But Arminius goes back to Holland and becomes the centre of a rising and growing theological movement that really is concessive on the issues of total depravity and predestination. And it takes off in Holland particularly interestingly enough, in the cities. Arminius' father-in-law is a merchant. And the merchants like Arminian theology. Why do they like Arminian theology? Because when you go soft on predestination, you tend to go soft on strict justification by faith as well. And if you go soft on strict justification by faith, what do you articulate? A kind of justification by works. Well, what does that connect with? It connects with Catholicism. You're a merchant. Who do you want to trade with? You want to trade with France and Spain. So you can see, 16th and 17th century, theology connects with economics as well. It gives you a framework for trading, developing trade partners in Catholic countries. And a major crisis develops in Holland between... uh, sort of the pro-Spanish party, essentially, who want to be concessive towards Catholicism, and the more vigorously reformed party who want to see the Spanish yoke decisively thrown off. And it culminates in 1610, the Arminians put together what they call a remonstrance, where they make five points. And in response, the states of Holland vote, I think, four to three, to convene a great synod in the city of Dordrecht, often shortened to Dort, to address these five points. And Dort produces, the synod at Dort produces four heads of doctrine dealing with the five points. That's where the five points of Calvinism come from. Total depravity, unconditional action, uh, limited atonement or, or, or effective atonement, depending on how you want to think about it, irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints. These days, we often tend to think of Calvinism as the five points. The Young, Restless and Reform book essentially takes its definition of Reformed theology as being four of the five points or even five of the five points. Limited atonement being one there's a bit of flex on. What's interesting, of course, is these five points only emerge in the early 17th century. Reformed theology already has a fairly clear confessional form and is already much, much bigger than the five points. There are no five points of Calvinism. Some debate about to what extent Calvin held all five anyway. But it's a misnomer. There's five points at the Synod of Dort. There's only four points that cover the five points of the Remonstrance at the Synod of Dort. But that's not Calvinism. Calvinism already much, 
uh, richer. And the Synod of Dort itself reflects that because the Synod of Dort doesn't just adopt its five points as this is our statement of orthodoxy. The Synod of Dort also adopts the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession, demonstrating that Calvinism is much bigger than the five points. It's a church-based thing that covers the whole range of Christian doctrine. Finally, and here I want to close, the Westminster Assembly. Westminster Assembly. The Westminster Assembly is convened in the 1640s after almost a century of struggles between elements in the church. The Church of England was uh, really founded in the 1530s and 1540s. One of the issues you have in England, of course, is um, uh, Dr. Sunshine last night referred to the conversion of Henry VIII to Protestantism. Henry VIII was never really a Protestant. He was a Catholic without the Pope. He repudiated the Pope because the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. But by and large, Henry VIII was, other than believing in the authority of the Pope, was as Catholic as they come. I mean, he wrote against Luther. He was a significant Catholic monarch without the Pope, really. The Church of England only Protestantizes in the 1540s and the 1550s. And one of the problems with Protestantizing the Church of England is it's all done by Acts of Parliament. And who sits in Parliament? Catholic nobility. How do you get them to Protestantize the Church? Well, you get them to move in that direction by selling them church lands cheap. It's a brilliant move. They make, they make a lot of money. And also, you take land from the church that's never going to go back because as committed as they may be to Catholic doctrine, they don't want to lose money. So you sell them church lands. But the pace of reform has to be painfully slow because a Catholic uh, nobility are not going to vote for radical Protestantism. Net result is, by the 1560s, the Reformation in England, as far as Parliament is concerned, is basically over. And although it is essentially reformed in doctrine, it looks a bit compromised and a bit Catholic in practice. Kneeling at communion, vestments, And you have 80 years of struggle over kneeling and communion investments in England. And there are two sides, there are two dimensions to that story. On the one side, there is what we might call the regular principle side, that you shouldn't be asked to do anything. The Puritans argue we shouldn't be required to do anything in worship that Scripture doesn't stipulate. So if Scripture doesn't tell us to kneel at communion, we shouldn't do it. Scripture doesn't tell us to sing hymns, we shouldn't do it. There's also a political side to it relating to Calvin's issue with the church and the state. The state has no right to demand from us anything that scripture doesn't demand. So the state can't tell me to go to church on a Sunday and use a particular form of words or sing a particular song that scripture doesn't stipulate. The power of the state is to be curbed relative to church issues. This struggle goes on for 80 years until finally in the early 1640s because of issues over tax and war Parliament goes to war with the king. I often say, you know, England, uh, uh, so often Britain invents things and then America does them just much bigger and much better. You know, we kind of invented civil wars. You did it much bigger and much better in the, uh, the 19th century. Parliament goes to war against the king and convenes a council or a synod, an assembly, initially to re- just to revise the liturgy and the articles of the Church of England. But then when it becomes clear that Parliament needs Scottish military support, the brief is broadened to turn the Church of England into a Presbyterian church by the development of a Presbyterian confession, a Presbyterian form of government, a Presbyterian form of worship. And that leads really to, the way, that is the Westminster Assembly. The Scots will only have a small presence at the Assembly five ministers and three elders with a few other people drifting in and out. The Scots will have no votes, but the Scots are without doubt the single most important factor in the Westminster Assembly. Scotland has 80 years of Presbyterianism behind it, thanks to John Knox and the Scots Confession. And bring that Presbyterian stamp to bear on the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s. And one of the things I just want to close with is to show how Reformed theology continued to develop, even after Calvin. And the Westminster Assembly is a great example of that. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 18, paragraph 3. Remember what I said about assurance. One of the great distinctives 
of Protestantism was that it argued from a very early stage, 1517, 1518, that personal assurance was the right, should be the possession of every Christian believer. Listen to what the Westminster Assembly says. And the way Luther will talk about faith, and even Calvin most of the time will say, you know, saving faith is being assured that the Lord is gracious to you. But listen to what the Westminster Assembly says. Uh, chapter 18, paragraph 3. This infallible assurance, it's the assurance of faith, do not, doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. And certain people seize on that paragraph and say, this shows how the Westminster divines repudiated Calvin and Luther. That in the early Reformation, of this great emphasis upon joyous assurance, here you have this terrible perversion of Calvinism that seems to be taking away assurance of faith and saying, well, you can have faith, but not be assured. I actually think this is one of the high points of the Westminster Confession. Far from a repudiation of Calvin, I think this, what rep- this represents a century, the result of a century of pastoral reflection on the impact of Reformation preaching on ordinary men and women and boys and girls. Think about it. In the Middle Ages, you're not expected to have assurance because if you have assurance, you will become complacent and you won't attend Mass and you'll thumb your nose at the church. It's still an argument that Catholics make today. It's not a bad argument on the surface of it. If you have assurance, what do you need the church for? The reformers come in and as is so often the way in history, they react. This is bad teaching. It doesn't reflect the joy and assurance that the New Testament talks about. So the reformers react against it and stress, no, this isn't right. Believers should be assured. Think about it. Let's go back to where I started these talks yesterday evening. 16th century. It's a disturbing world to live in. We think today is disturbing. 16th century, much more disturbing. Not only do you have all the incredible social flux involved in the rise of the cities and the decline of the countryside, you've got things like black plagues striking here and there. It's a frightening and disturbing place to be. You're never more than a few inches from death, it seems. And you go to church, and you expect church to be just like it was when you were growing up, but it's different. They talk in a language you can understand. And that isn't really what you're going to church for. You don't go to church to understand. You go to church just to feel the way you used to feel when you were a kid. But not only that, the preaching is different. The preaching is, you've got to believe this for yourself. You've got to own it for yourself. You have to be assured for yourself. That kind of preaching is going to generate pastoral problems that have never occurred in the church before. You can only, you know, put it simply, you can only have pastoral problems with lack of assurance when assurance is presented to you as something that you should normally possess. What's beautiful about this paragraph, and I think it's systematicians who tend to get hung up on this paragraph, rather than church historians and people who think in concrete terms about this is connecting with real people in real context. What's beautiful about this paragraph is it shows how reform theology continues to develop in the century after Calvin, in that the formulations and the emphases of Calvin and his colleagues, they solved certain problems and they generated new ones. And the church continued to reflect upon these problems and to try to solve them. And that leads me, I suppose, to my final point. Calvinism is a misnomer. I prefer to think of the reformed theology of the reformed churches. Theology is a church activity. It's not something pursued or done by individuals. It's always something done corporate. Even for a Calvin or a Luther, their most creative theology was almost certainly done in conversations with their colleagues, in wrestling with passages of Scripture with other colleagues and seeking advice. It was done in synods and assemblies of the church. You get rid of the Pope, but you don't replace the Pope with just yourself and your Bible. You replace him with the church. What I like about the Westminster Assembly is it represents in many ways all that I described about Calvin this morning, the way he does theology. If you read the minutes, there's continual reference to the great thinkers and creeds and confessions of the past, a conscious desire to connect with the best of the Catholic tradition of the church. 
But there's also, as in chapter 18, obvious signs of a desire to connect with where the church is today as well. And that, I think, is a model worthy pursuing. And if all a conference like this does is make us look to the past, then it served partial purpose. But I also hope that we've shown myself being able to sow some ideas that make us look to the present as a way of building towards the future as well. So thanks very much for listening so patiently.